If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this. People, have you ever had a real life encounter with a folklore creature or legend you believe to be a fairy, gnome, elf, or similar entity? I was in Ireland, and I saw something. I was on a bus heading from town to the hotel, and I was sitting on the back seat in the middle, so I could look out the window. We were going through the small, tight roads and turning corners slowly, and I was just enjoying myself. We turned a corner, and right in the headlights, I saw an old woman with long grey hair show up. Her mouth was hanging open, and her eyes were wide pits, staring straight at me. No one else saw her, and she was gone in an instant. I looked back as the bus drove by to no avail. In the woods near my town, there is supposed to be a witch's circle. Apparently, it was once the gathering place of a coven. There is a local urban legend that talks about witches being hung there or nearby, although I don't know how true that is. Apparently, the people who killed the witches left an empty rope for the devil, since the devil is supposed to be the 13th member of a coven. Apparently, if you step inside the circle, you are cursed to die in three days. Some quick background. I have Native American blood on my dad's side, and I grew up listening to all sorts of scary stories from my aunt, which contributed to my lifelong fascination with the paranormal. Back in the 1930s, my two great uncles were young men. My grandmother grew up in a small house in a tiny town called Tallahina, Oklahoma, so keep in mind that it wasn't especially secure. Anyway, when this happened, it was the dead of winter. My great uncles were awakened, and they saw what my dad described as some kind of Bigfoot-like creature. This thing was said to be eight feet or so tall, had incredibly long, sharp claws, and had eyes that glittered like diamonds. The thing then brought its claws down and tore in half the quilt my uncles were sleeping under, and then it bolted out the kitchen door into the night. My uncle grabbed their shotgun and ran after it. They found neither the hide nor the hair of the beast, but they did find massive footprints that would have put an NBA star to shame. I wonder if it was a skinwalker or a wendigo. Who knows? My grandmother once saw a large white demon dog. She said that it was see-through, had red eyes, and was the size of a cow. It was said that in that area, you couldn't leave things out at night, toys and such, because evil things would curse them and they'd make you sick, so they had to be thrown out. I'm not sure how common this belief is, but I judge that it's pretty widespread. One of my uncles was out one night, and he ended up being stalked by a will-o'-wisp type thing that morphed into a jack-o'-lantern-like entity. The flying pumpkin spirit hurled itself at his head, I believe. I scared him sh-less, of course. My grandmother's family were neighbors of some witches who practiced all sorts of black magic. I have a ton of stories about them. Some of them sound pretty outlandish. Me and my friend were biking from his house in the woods in early spring into a small town called Clayton. We all live in South Jersey, which is technically part of the Pine Barrens, which, if you know, is just an eerie place. Anyway, on the way there, we biked on this bridge that goes past the lake and onto a very long street into town. We stopped to get some ice cream and just hang out. It's raining out, but only very lightly, so we didn't mind. In fact, we liked it because the roads in town were empty. We made our way back down that long street, and he challenged me to a race. I had just been injured in a basketball game, but I accepted anyway, and he won by a long shot. He was past the bridge, and I didn't see him, as the road after the bridge back to his house turned sharply. I'm on the bridge, and I look past the metal barriers, and three tall, dark-colored creatures are standing about 15 feet from me. They weren't looking at me but more at the lake and beyond. When I passed, they didn't acknowledge me or even look at me. At first, I thought they were three bears standing up, because it couldn't have been three humans as they were at least seven to eight feet tall. But they were way too skinny to be bears, skinnier than your average human. I made my way home to tell my friend, who was already home at this point, what I saw. At first, he didn't believe me, but eventually he saw I was serious, and he wanted to go back. I said he could, but I refused. I had no idea what danger those beings could pose. To this day, I don't know if they were aliens or what. I never saw them again, and I hope to keep it that way. I've heard other people in my town talk about them, but they were always just a legend to me until I actually saw them. Has anyone heard about the hidden dog man of Clarksville, Tennessee? I don't know much about it, but my roommate is from the area, and he swears that it's a true thing, he also swears he's kissed a girl before, but I haven't seen him talk to anyone but me in all of the seven months we've lived together. Apparently the hidden dog man would hang out by one of the movie theaters and, while in dog form, would draw people to an alley in order to isolate them. Afterwards, apparently, he would rapidly shapeshift from dog to man and vice versa while yelling. I'm not sure about it, but I figured I would ask the experts if this was a legend or a real thing, 
etc. I have a super vivid memory from when I was really young, like 6 to 8, I lived on Long Island, and my parents took me and my little brother to the beach all the time. I grew up around oceans and water, so my parents trusted me to run around the shore without too much supervision, as long as I didn't swim where I couldn't touch the bottom. I remember I was collecting shells and rocks on the bay while my mom was feeding my little brother, and I climbed around these huge brown rocks that were halfway in the water. There was a boy who looked a little older than me, sitting in the middle of the rocks. I didn't really think it was weird because I was like seven, and I just asked him what he was doing. He didn't say anything, but he smiled and picked up a few shells from the water and put them in my bucket. When he came more into the light, he looked super pale, almost light blue, and his hair looked like green, clumpy seaweed. His eyes were huge and black, but I was taught it was rude to comment on what people looked like, so I didn't say anything. I just hopped off the rocks into the shallow water, but he followed me. He said something to me, but it wasn't in English, and he just kept going into the deeper water and bringing me cool shells. My mom called for me to leave, and I said bye to the kid, thanked her for the shells, and walked up the shore to my mom. I told her about the boy, but she said she didn't see anyone, even though she was watching me. I don't know. I did have a pretty active imagination as a kid, but I remember this so vividly. I'm really into mythology now as an adult and can't help but think that maybe he was some sort of water fairy, merperson, or something. Or maybe just a weird boy who was good at swimming and needed a hairbrush. My mom not seeing him could mean that I imagined him, or that whole thing about fairies only letting children see them. There's a ghost town, no pun intended, in the Texas panhandle that used to be the county seat for Hutchinson County. There's a lot of peculiar things in the area of the ghost town, like a graveyard mostly full of babies, appropriately coined the baby graves, and Stella's Hill, which is rumored to be the place where the townspeople hung the local witch, who then cast a spell on the town that would make all the babies die and people move away. As far as the spell, I can't vouch for the validity of that story. However, Plemons was, or is believed to be, the local satanic meeting site. Personally, I have never seen anything odd out there, but my mother went to the baby graves in the 70s and saw a sheet blocking the entrance and a fire glowing back in the cemetery. The next day, she went back and found a lot of dead black cats. 20 years later, my cousin found cattle hanging from the side of the bridge. I personally believe these claims to be true, and I believe satanic happenings take place in Plemons. The Legend of the Saco River The early English settlers in Maine were not welcomed by the Native American tribes. The exception to this rule was the Sokokis tribe. The Sokokis helped the English, and the English helped the Sokokis. There was a time of peace, and even the other Indian tribes were starting to become friendly towards the English. One of the most revered leaders of the Sokokis was Squandro. Squandro was even more friendly to the English than the others. He even risked his life to save a drowning white child. Squandro's heart was turned against the whites, however, because of a cruel joke. In the summer of 1675, an English vessel lay at anchor near the mouth of the Saco. Three sailors from the ship rode up the river and came upon the Indian settlement at Factory Island, then known as Indian Island. They noted a young Indian woman crossing the channel in a canoe. With her was her infant son. I have heard, said one sailor, that these Indian brats can swim at birth, like a very duck, dog, or beaver. What say you? Laughed another. Let us find out. The sailors blocked the Indian woman's way in the channel and tore the screaming infant from her arms. While one held her back, the other threw the helpless child overboard, where it immediately sank in the river. The mother broke free and dove in after the baby. She rescued him, but he soon fell ill and died. The sailors, thinking it all a fine joke, rowed back to their ship, unaware of what they had done. They did not know that this Indian woman was no ordinary squaw but the wife of a great sagamore, they were further unaware that this little baby they had, in effect, killed was Manui, the son of Squandro. For three days and nights, Squandro mourned at the grave of Manui, while. On the third day, Squandro went down to the river and stood on its banks with his arms outstretched. He cursed the waters of the Sako and vowed revenge on the whites who had killed his son. He commanded the spirits of the river to take the lives of three white men every year until they were driven from Sako's hemlock trees. Since then, every year, at least three white men die. My grandmother told my aunt about witches who would take out their insides and put them in trees so that they could fly around at night. The only way to kill these things was to chop down the tree and burn their innards. That's all I knew about them. When my grandmother was older, there was this thing in her house called a stagini. It's a type of owl spirit, it was apparently quite a nuisance, as this weird, bird-like entity would leave giant piles of shit next to a crack in the wall. 
these were like feces of the sort that a human or a large dog would leave behind. Anyway, she plugged the crack up in the wall where it was coming in and out of and didn't have any further problems with it. Strange, but true. One of the creepiest stories I heard was that my grandmother saw my great-uncle Lonnie out in the yard, chopping wood. Nothing strange about that, right? Well, actually, it turned out that he was in the house the entire time, and it was some kind of thing that took the form of my uncle, perhaps to lure someone out there. I only know that whatever the spirit or entity's intentions were, it wasn't anything good. So yeah, my grandmother's encounters included seeing a doppelganger of her brother. I spent a few weeks in the Languedoc region of France and did a lot of walking in the hills. During a few hikes, we witnessed movement in the undergrowth, which we attributed to some small animal or bird. However, whilst taking a rest near a gorge about three miles outside Ade, we witnessed what looked like a little toadstool-like thing moving across the ground. I'm not a great believer in the paranormal, but I cannot rule out some kind of woodland energy spirit. But I have a theory that certain types of fungi that reside in the deep earth for long periods have modal stages resembling tiny woodling-like figures. I don't have any actual evidence to back up this theory, however, I believe that certain fungi reproduce via flagellated spores, or zoospores. Certain types may have evolved modal spores that can move short distances over terrain, especially in damp areas. There seems to be a lot of mushroom-like beings in European folklore, maybe there could be a link between mushrooms, fungi, toadstools, pixies, elves, etc. Just a theory. One night around 4 a.m., featuring Myers, Florida, I was outside with my so, and we encountered something. It whistled like a person, it had wings that looked like dragonfly wings, but there was nothing like a body. So imagine a green pair of dragonfly-looking wings hovering in the air with nothing attached to them. It whistled as if trying to get our attention. It flew in front of us for a good few seconds, no more than two feet away, close enough to get a good look, and it felt as if it definitely had intelligence about it. Mind you, it was raining, and this thing was hovering in the rain, completely unfazed. If it were an insect, it would, a, not be able to fly in the rain with such ease, b, not whistle like a human being, and c, have a visible freaking body. So yeah, that's my story. The fact that my so witnessed the exact same thing is confirmation that I didn't imagine it. We both know what we saw that night, and it was not from this world. I was a hardcore atheist at the time, so you can imagine this experience shook me up quite a bit. I looked all over the internet for similar encounters, and they all pointed out fairies. I couldn't simply forget about it and go on with life like nothing had happened. I still don't believe in a higher power that answers prayers and miracle manages everything because I don't have proof. But I cannot call myself an atheist either because I do believe in other dimensions and beings that live in those dimensions. I also firmly believe in the spirit world and reincarnation now, but I digress. I may have encountered the whistler. The other night, around 10 or 11 p.m., my mom and I were watching a movie. It has been raining hard, so there was basically just white noise coming from outside. As I'm watching the movie, for some reason or another, the whistler pops into my head. Then I remembered the actual whistle with its inexplicably chilling, distinct tone. Then I heard the faintest sound of the whistle, but it was so faint that I thought it was just in my head. Kind of like when you can hear and see things in your head, but there's no actual noise. But then it got a little louder. From outside. I kind of had a moment where I was struck cold and in shock with disbelief. There is no way I'm actually hearing it. It must be the movie. The next one is louder, and now I know I'm not imagining it, so I pause halfway through the whistle, and I turn to my mom. It ends, and a moment later, another whistle. This time very loud, as if whoever is whistling is standing outside the window, which was open. I literally felt a jolt go through me, and I just yelled, holy sht, did you just hear that? And my mom said something along the lines of, yeah, that whistling sound? I thought it was in the movie. Then it goes on to mimic the whistle. This legit gave me chills and freaked me out. Even creepier is how it just stopped the moment I called attention to it and muted the TV. And since we live in an apartment complex, there are constantly people walking around outside that you can hear, but when the whistling stopped, it was just silence. There wasn't any sound of movement, but I wasn't going near the damn window. I just sat there and stared at it. Thankfully, the legend states that if you hear the whistle loud and clear, that means he's far away. When it's quiet or in the distance, he's close. Actually, that makes it even creepier, because that means those hushed ones I heard meant it was somewhere close during that time. Also, why did it happen to start right after the whole whistler story just randomly popped into my head? I think I'm losing my mind, but my mom heard it. There's a big one in my area, the ghost train. 
I haven't experienced it myself yet, though. I have seen a few things I can't exactly explain in my immediate neighborhood, though. I use neighborhood loosely here, we're rural. We've had a cougar-like big cat run across the road in front of us one night. It looked very much like a gray cougar, but with extremely short legs and a tail that looked more like a snow leopard's in length. It could be a cougar with dwarfism, but the body and head were full-sized. I looked up some information about what big cats are in my area, supposedly none besides the bobcat, and came across the tails of the Santa on several sites. I'm not saying that's what it was, but it was definitely not normal. Coming home around 2 a.m. One night around this time of year, we had to slow down for fire trucks tending to an accident. Movement in the huge field off to our right made me snap my head around and lean forward for a better look. There was a huge brown shape, think moose height, but with a bear's mass, running very fast diagonally away from the road towards the woods. The husband asked, you see it too? When I said yes but had no clue what it was beyond a brown shape, he told me he'd seen it every night around this time on his way home for a couple weeks. Neither one of us has seen it since, and we travel that road often. I just want to share a couple of my own fairy encounters that I 100% believe to be true and not my imagination. In the first grade, I slept over at my friend's house. We had done a lot of fairy hunting activity, more like trying to summon them. We made fairy houses, watched Tinker Bell, and chanted anything that you could imagine. So, I wake up and check my surroundings to see if anything has changed since I went to bed. In my peripheral vision, I see a little figure more or less hovering above the ground, it was smaller than a finger. It was black and had wings. My shoe, with laces, was sitting on the ground, and the bedroom door was open. The figure flew out the door, but on its way out, it grabbed my shoelace and pulled my shoe onto its side and closer to the door. Unfortunately, my friend did not see it, and she still does not believe me because her sister had been the one responding to our fairy letters the whole time. But it would have been impossible for her sister to have done it. The second time I saw one, around fifth grade, it was a very similar experience. I was outside in the carport when, once again, I saw something in my peripheral. A small black figure hovers above the ground. Flying very fast. I saw it go into some short shrubs, it was not windy, and I heard and saw it push the leaves out of their way. My sister was there, but once again, I did not see it. Lastly, in high school, I dove back into fairies. I researched them and did all I could to try to interact with them again. I was outside during twilight with my friend, literally talking about them. When we heard the most magical, peculiar sound, which to us sounded like it was coming from an old tree stump. Imagine if Maybell flowers, lilies of the valley, could ring, and there were one thousands of them. That is what we heard, a soft and higher pitched sound. We both heard it. We go to investigate where it is coming from, and there are no birds or bugs that we can see. Neither of us had heard a sound like it before, nor have we heard one since. Honestly, hearing this sound is even more convincing than actually seeing them before. The camp ghost. I was 15. At the time, all I knew was that I had gone to sleepwalking. I was volunteering for an off-season respite at a summer camp for people with disabilities. I had fallen asleep in the top bunk, in a cabin that was attached to the main building of the camp. I woke up disoriented and uncomfortably in a chair, next to a locked door, in the activity room at the camp. It wasn't until several years later that I got the rest of the story. During college, I started working as a counselor during the summers at the camp. As any summer camp does, this one had legends, stories, and ghosts. The camp even shared a fence line with an old mining cemetery and had abandoned mine shafts on the property. But then there was the story of Albert. He was a friendly, playful ghost. He was a camper who had tragically died at the camp many years prior. He turned on lights, opened doors, and just played little tricks every now and then. Apparently he loved camp, it was an amazing place, and he never wanted to leave. The scary part was how he had died. He was prone to sleepwalking. One night he walked out of his cabin, somehow fell in the pool, and there was no one there to save him. The camp ended up tearing out the pool and, years later, rebuilding it in a safer spot. That night I went sleepwalking, I was asleep in the same cabin where Albert slept, and the locked door I woke up next led to where the pool used to be. Shadow people, I had trouble believing in them. I thought they were urban legends like Slender Man, Bloody Mary, and Zozo. Videos claiming to capture them were always lacking. I went to bed as usual that night in mid-August. The night was perfect, not hot and not cool. Great sleeping weather. Nothing was happening that I was interested in doing, so I decided to go to bed and do a bit of reading until I was tired enough to fall asleep. That was at 11, and I finally got tired at 12.30 and drifted off to sleep. Suddenly, 
I was startled awake from a sound sleep. I mean, wide awake, I could move all the appendages, so it wasn't sleep paralysis. I think it was close to 3 a.m. or thereabouts. The street lamp and moon shone through my bedroom window, that never bothered me, as I can sleep with the lights on or off, but I noticed a figure, or rather a silhouette of a figure, standing inside my window. I was convinced it was a break-in and laid quietly, waiting for him to make his move, but he never did. He was around 6 feet 2 inches tall and broad-chested. I mean, he was big and just staring at me, never moving. I won't deny that I was scared, thinking this guy was going to bash my brains or suffocate me, but that didn't happen. As I was watching him try to figure out how that big guy got in my window without being stuck, he started to fade away until he wasn't there anymore. I lay there for a few minutes longer, thinking that if I got out of bed, he'd reappear. After what seemed like forever, I jumped out of bed and turned on the light. I examined the window and found nothing unusual, such as being smashed or even open, it was how I had left it. You would probably think that I wouldn't go back to sleep after that. I did, but with the lights on. To be honest, I was relieved that it was a shadow person rather than someone breaking into my house. The guy faded out of existence, I think. The thought crossed my mind that he just went invisible to catch me as I got out of bed to turn on the light. But I haven't had a second encounter with any shadow people as of right now. The True, and Frightening, Story of Portlock Portlock, also known as Port Chatham, is an abandoned town on the Alaska coast. Folklore says that the town was abandoned due to Bigfoot attacks. People went into the woods and turned up later as mutilated bodies. One was discovered killed by a blow to the head. Residents found enormous tracks and saw a huge, hairy man-beast in the woods. Eventually the locals had enough of this Bigfoot aggression, and in 1949 they left, all of them, and they never came back. That's the folklore. It paints a scary picture of an aggressive and violent Bigfoot. It's the basis for TV shows like Alaska Killer Bigfoot, numerous internet articles and YouTube videos, and at least one, not very good, book. The trouble is, none of it is correct. Well, yes, the inhabitants did leave town. That's true. But not because of Bigfoot attacks and all the deaths and maimings. The truth is, there were no mysterious deaths in Portlock. The town closed down because a new highway offered better transportation links and took away the need for a port for sea traffic. Without a reason for its existence, the town just withered and died. It's sad, but that's economics. All the Bigfoot stories came from just one person, many years after the event, with no corroborating evidence. There are dozens of stories about one particular coal mine near where I live. Some old people who are descended from the miners who work there swear it's haunted. During the first few months of 1890, miners at the Morpha Colliery in Margam were subjected to a string of supernatural occurrences. There were reports of fierce hounds, known as the Red Dogs of Morpha, running through the district at night. The colliery itself was said to be filled with a sweet rose-like perfume, the source widely believed to be invisible death flowers. Cries for help and the sound of falling earth were often heard, flickering lights called corpse candles appeared and disappeared in the tunnels, and the ghosts of long-dead miners were seen working with phantom white horses, pulling the coal trams. In a superstitious workforce, it was commonly believed the reported supernatural events were harbingers of disaster. For some reason, on March 10, 1890, nearly half the morning shift stayed home, saying they had been disturbed by weird stories of ghostly visitations. Only half of the morning shift went into the mine that day, and if it weren't for the superstitious nature of the miners, surely many more lives would have been lost. The official report into the 1890 disaster acknowledged the rumors that the mine was haunted. It blamed the fact that the workings extended to the sea and that the rumbling noise was heard in underground workings when the sea was rough. One miner was said to have been so frightened by these noises that, three weeks before the disaster, he refused to go underground again. He said he had heard similar noises when another explosion happened at the mine in 1870, and he had a presentation that a similar disaster could not be far off again. I remember years ago, when I was in Boy Scouts, I went on a regular camp out with my troop. We went to the property of someone who was an old family friend, and I used to go fishing often when I was younger. The layout of the property was pretty neat to me, there were two ponds, and their house was in the middle of the two ponds. Anyway, we get there on a Friday evening, and we set up camp to the left of the house, close to the runoff for the pond. After eating dinner, we decided to play hide and seek for a while before we turned in for the night. It was my turn to go hide, so I decided to run closer to the front pond of the property by some trees, our campsite was probably 200 yards away from where I was hiding. It was pretty dark where I was hiding, I was behind a tree waiting to run if I was found by the person who was it. For some odd reason, 
I remember seeing a tree stump to my right. I don't know why it stood out to me until, while I was waiting, I remembered that in my peripheral vision to my right, I could see two red dots appear at the top of the tree stump about 10 feet from me, and I soon realized that they were eyes. They appeared as if they had been there the whole time, but I just realized that they were there. If I stared directly at them, it seemed like I couldn't focus on them as well. On the other hand, if I didn't look directly at them, I could see them more clearly. I wasn't sure if I should find another hiding spot or if I should just wait it out, and hopefully it'll go away. I started having a sense of caution come over me, which started building up to a sense of fear. When I was trying to figure out what I should do, the eyes started to rise from where they originally were. What I thought was a tree stump started getting taller. As it was rising, I noticed that it had a humanoid figure, but it was much taller than your average person, like 7 to 8 feet tall. When I realized that it was a human figure, I ran back to camp. I didn't tell anyone about it because I was doubting myself about what I had seen. To this day, I still don't know exactly what it was or what I felt. Does anyone have any idea of what this could have been? In German folklore, a Nashserer is a sort of vampire. The word Nashserer translates to after, knock, living off, zaren, likely alluding to their living after death or living off humans after death, in addition to the choice of knock for after, which is similar to knocked, night. A Nashserer is created most commonly after suicide and sometimes from an accidental death. According to German lore, a person does not become a Nashserer from being bitten or scratched, the transformation happens after death and is not communicable. Nash Sarahs are also related to sickness and disease. If a large group of people died of the plague, the first person to have died is believed to be a Nash Sarah. Typically, a Nash Sarah devours its family members upon waking. It has also been said that they devour their own bodies, including their funeral shrouds, and the more of themselves they eat, the more of their family they physically drain. It is not unlikely that the idea of the dead eating themselves might have risen from bodies in open graves that had been partly eaten by scavengers like rats. The official killing myth says a Nash Sarah can be killed by placing a coin in its mouth and then chopping off its head. It can be discerned from this that a mere coin in the mouth may result in paralysis, as some myths say that a stake through a vampire's heart does. Finding Nash Sarah in order to kill them is not difficult, it is characteristic of a Nash Sarah to lie in its grave with its thumb in its opposite hand and its left eye open. Additionally, they are easily found while eating their burial shroud due to the noise they produce doing so. In American folklore, the hodag is a fearsome critter resembling a large bullhorned carnivore with a row of thick, curved spines down its back. The hodag was said to be born from the ashes of cremated oxen, as the incarnation of the accumulation of abuse the animals had suffered at the hands of their masters. The history of the hodag is strongly tied to the city of Rhinelander, where it was claimed to have been discovered. The hodag has figured prominently in early Paul Bunyan stories. In 1893, newspapers reported the discovery of a hodag in Rhinelander, Wisconsin. The articles claimed the hodag had the head of a frog, the grinning face of a giant elephant, thick short legs set off by huge claws, the back of a dinosaur, and a long tail with spears at the end. The reports were instigated by well-known Wisconsin land surveyor, timber cruiser, and prankster Eugene Shepard, who rounded up a group of local people to capture the animal. The group reported that they needed to use dynamite to kill the beast. A photograph of the remains of the charred beast was released to the media. It was the fiercest, strangest, most frightening monster ever to set razor-sharp claws on the earth. It became extinct after its main food source, all white bulldogs, became scarce in the area. Shepard claimed to have captured another hodag in 1896, and this one was captured alive. According to Shepard's reports, he and several bear wrestlers placed chloroform on the end of a long pole, which they worked into the cave of the creature, where it was overcome. He displayed this hodag at the first Oneida County Fair. Thousands of people came to see the hodag at the fair or at Shepard's display in a shanty at his house. Having connected wires to it, Shepard would occasionally move the creature, which would typically send the already skittish viewers fleeing the display. There were a few times when I was a small kid that I was sure some other kids were inviting me to come outside and play, but when I asked an adult if I could go outside and they looked out the window to check out these kids, they'd just see coyotes scatter. Once, when I went to ask the only two adults in the house at the time, I found that they were both stuck. They describe it as feeling like they drank a lot of knee quill or something. Their entire bodies felt heavy, and they felt like if they stopped fighting it, they would fall asleep. There was knocking at the front door, and the adults wanted to check it but couldn't get up. They say they heard us kids open the door and talk to someone through the screen. We came and asked if we could go play outside with the other kids, but they told us to shut the door and lock it instead. Later, after they had recovered, 
They went outside and found a huge number of coyote tracks all around the house that hadn't been there that morning. We never had coyotes come that close to the house, especially during the day. My parents asked a local elder for advice, and they sent someone out to smudge the house and explain some of the lore to us. The gist was that they were mischievous tricksters. Not malicious, but also not benign. They weren't trying to lure us kids out to eat us. They probably really just wanted to play. But they wouldn't care if we got lost or injured along the way. They would lead us out into the woods and play with us until they were satisfied, then disappear, and we would be small children lost in the forest as the sun was setting. And there could be other things in the dark that are malicious. After the smudging and getting the basic advice to never go outside when they invited us to, it never happened again, though. This was a first-hand experience from my first cousin and brother. Edisto, South Carolina, which is a small island separated by the Edisto River, is full of ghost stories. This particular incident happened to my brother and cousin one night. My cousin, who'd grown up in the area, was telling my brother about a girl who was buried alive in the 1800s. Apparently, what happened was that she was struck with an illness and pronounced dead. They had her funeral, and she was interred in the family mausoleum. As it turns out, she was not dead at all and was buried alive. Needless to say, no matter how much she screamed and begged for help, no one could hear her as the mausoleum was solid marble. She died, probably not long after. One day, the man who kept the cemetery saw that the door to the mausoleum was completely blown off. He looked inside, and the marble plate over the young girl's crypt was also blown off, and her casket was exposed. He opened the coffin to make certain that there had been no grave robbery, and when he opened the coffin, he saw her face frozen with terror, and there were deep grooves in the top of the casket where she had tried to claw her way out. He realized what had happened, and quite frankly, back in those days, it wasn't uncommon for people to be mistaken for dead only to wake up later. Now the legend goes that, to this day, no door can be put on the mausoleum because she just blows it off, and if you get one of these pieces, you'll see claw marks on it. Now my cousin knew of this story and told my oldest brother, and of course my brother didn't believe it. So, one night, when they were hanging out, my brother conned him into taking him to the cemetery. Now, my cousin did drive him there but refused to get out of the truck and go into the cemetery. My brother went into the cemetery, and sure enough, in the oldest part of the cemetery, there was the mausoleum with no door. My brother looked around and saw chunks of marble on the ground near the mausoleum. Idiot said that he picked up a piece, looked at it, and saw grooves in it. Being an even bigger idiot, he actually took that piece with him to show my cousin. My cousin tried to get him to put it back, but he wouldn't, so they left. It wasn't long before they were driving away and saw a woman standing in the middle of the road. My cousin slammed on the brakes, and she vanished. My brother was freaked out, so he threw the piece of marble out of the window and into the brush. My cousin turned the truck around and didn't get a hundred yards down the road when she showed up again. Again, my cousin slammed on the brakes as she disappeared, and in the place where she stood was the piece of marble that my idiot brother had thrown out the window. He got out of the truck, picked up the piece of marble, and they hurried up to take it back to where my brother picked it up. Did I mention that my brother is an idiot? The Purple Light Bridge, here's a tale that comes from a little town in Lancaster County called Elizabeth Town. It's called the Purple Light Bridge, and it's been a story that started in the early 1900s. It could be more than a tale, though, since there is proof of the purple light and the tragic tale behind it. So one of the tales is that a young boy is struck by a train on the bridge that intersects between Turnpike Road and High Street which is where the train station for Amtrak is. It supposedly happened in 1934, and some people claim there is proof of the accident. I looked at the US archives of train accidents and saw nothing, but it seems it only put up large accidents rather than a small one like this. So after the boy's death, it is said that late at night you can see a purple light on the bridge or in the gorge where the train track runs from the north, heading southwest. People like to argue that you can see the purple lights at another location, and they're seen there and not by the train station. They claim that you can see the lights under the bridge that is above the train tracks on Bossler Road. The Bossier Road for this purple light had another tale. A mother brought her son to the bridge, and under that bridge, she hung her son's boyfriend, then herself. Locals say that the purple light you see is the mother and the son. Some people have claimed the purple light comes from the moonlight reflecting off the rocks below the bridge. Yet even more people claim that it's actually the bridge a couple miles away in Newville, near Elizabeth Town. For those of you who don't know, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, was the site of the bloodiest battle of the American Civil War. An estimated 50,000 lives in total were lost, and over 10,000 of them have never been found to this day. Thousands are buried in the sprawling farmlands and forests in unmarked graves, and no remains have been discovered since 1997. 
This story takes place on July 3, 2022, the final day of the battle, at one of the more unknown paranormal hotspots in town, known by locals as Suicide Bridge. Many people are afraid to even set foot near it because its tragic history makes the energy there so unpredictable. It was initially constructed in 1886, and eventually the road was blocked off in 1998, so the only way to access it today is by bike or a short walk on foot. My friend and I arrived around 8 that evening, parked our cars at the more distant entrance, and began the walk down the narrow, paved road surrounded by trees on both sides. As we got closer, we saw an investigation team on the bridge and chose not to bother them, so we turned around to walk back to the car with plans of coming back later. As we walked back, my friend and I heard twigs cracking loudly in the woods next to us. He began to get paranoid and told me he thought someone was there, but I brushed it off as a deer or some other wildlife just passing through. As we neared the car, my friend walked ahead of me and stopped in his tracks. Caroline. Someone is in there. I cautiously walked up next to him and looked over the break in the trees. Not 15 feet off the road, there was a figure there facing right towards us, not moving or speaking, just standing there. All I saw was a big white beard and white hair, but even in the daylight, the man's face was completely black, I couldn't make out a single feature. I stood paralyzed with fear for a moment, and then a sense of impending doom washed over me. Something was extremely wrong. My legs started running before my brain told them to, and I began sprinting full speed for the car while my friend trailed right behind me. It was the first time I had ever been in true terror. I fumbled with my keys to unlock the car and peeled out before my friend had even fully closed his door. While still processing what we had experienced, we decided to drive around to the other entrance, which is right off the main road, to talk to the people on the bridge. As we walked up, we heard their equipment going crazy, and as soon as our feet touched the wood, it stopped. They were very kind, and when we told them what we had seen, they all looked at each other in shock. They told us they were there a few days prior, and they saw the same blank-faced man walk off the road and down the bank to the creek below before disappearing under the bridge. I was too scared to take a picture or a video, but I know now that what we saw was not just some strange guy wandering the forest. Does anyone know of any legends or stories attached to the bridge involving this apparition? Was it a spirit or something much more sinister? I may never know, but I will never forget the fear and dread I felt at Suicide Bridge. 80s Irish Shadow Man I'm a girl living in Ireland. Basically, it all started in primary 7, when me and a friend's family were cycling through the grounds of an old famine-era workhouse, which is now either a small hospital or clinic, not sure which. Their dad suggested a race around an outbuilding, but I stayed behind. As I was waiting, I saw a tall figure beneath one of the trees in the grounds, beside a footpath leading off the grounds to a park. It reached the lowest branches, which were about 10 feet or more. It was wearing a dark hooded robe. It was so clear that I immediately thought either my friends were playing a trick on me or it was a massive Halloween decoration somehow tied to the tree. I called my friend's name, but they appeared behind me, having come back from their race. Before I said anything, they saw what I was looking at, and the dad set off towards it, saying not to worry and that it was just a dummy tied to the tree. We followed, but as we got closer, it vanished, it sort of melted into the shadows. We cycled the length of the path, which had razor wire fences on either side trying to find a trace of who or what we'd seen, but never saw anybody. They couldn't have run the length of the path before we cycled it, and the end of the path was visible from the start. From then on, I started having dreams that would feature a man in a black hooded robe. He always appeared in darkness and was surrounded by shadows, but the dreams were actually quite nice. He would sort of offer topical advice on what was happening in my life, which always seemed to help. Sometimes he wouldn't wear a robe, and he was pale with dark curling hair, quite gaunt looking. He almost always wears black, apart from the odd baggy poet shirt thing, the most stylish of all the shirts and the zenith of 1980s fashion. If I'm honest, I'm a bit skeptical of ghosts and spooky stuff and would have ignored all this as just a one-off weird prank and some dreams if I hadn't started seeing the hooded figure again in real life. Around the time of my senior year, lower and upper sixth, I started seeing a shadowy figure walking past the windows of my house, and when I saw my reflection in mirrors or screens, I would sometimes catch a glimpse of a tall figure behind me. My initial reaction was to think I was developing schizophrenia or had some sort of neurological damage I wasn't aware of. I actually asked a few of my friends if I ever acted delusional. One night, I was in the kitchen with my dad, who firmly does not believe in ghosts or gods and enjoys debunking the paranormal. I saw the figure outside, but I didn't say anything because I was scared I'd be sent to a mental hospital. I know now that's not how these things work, but it was a big fear of mine, Suddenly, my dad was opening the back door. He went outside and, 
after a moment, started shouting. When he came in, he said he'd seen somebody outside and thought it was my grandfather or our neighbor visiting, but when he got to the gate, nobody was there. He made a big deal of checking the security camera he has installed in his garden, which showed nobody. My brother and father then both admitted they'd seen a shadowy figure walking past the windows at night, like me. On multiple occasions, there have been three or four people in a room when this happens, and we've actually had guests open the back door to let the man in, only to be very confused that nobody's there. It's so mundane and visible that your immediate reaction is to open the door and say hello. The dreams are still continuing to this day, and so are the figures. I'm not a paranormal person and don't come from a paranormal family. My grandmother and great aunt on one side are very spiritual, and my great aunt on the other is extremely religious, to the point of giving me relics she was gifted by a priest, but the rest of my relatives, including my brother, father, and mother, are all non-religious and interested in science. I don't know what to make of this, searching online only reveals some obscure Irish myths about the dark man, some stories that are clearly hallucinations, and a lot of scary or horrible experiences, which I definitely haven't had. I live on a long island, and there are tons of legends about various places on the island. I think the most notorious, besides the Amityville house, is probably Sweet Hollow Road slash Mount Misery, as well as Mary's Grave and Lake Ronkonkoma. They say a bus full of children crashed on Sweet Hollow, and there's also a story about a few boys hanging themselves on the same bridge where the bus crashed. If you put your car in neutral near the bus crash site, the ghosts of the kids will push your car forward, and if you sprinkle some powder on the trunk of your car, you'll see little handprints from the ghosts. There's another story about a day camp back in the 1930s that was along that road, and children killed there, and you can see their ghosts along the road sometimes. There's also a ghost cop that was supposedly killed, and people say if he pulls you over, you'll see the gunshot wound in the back of his head when he walks back to his car, or he gets his head blown off while walking back to his car. There are also some who say a woman in white walks along the road. I've been there as I don't live far, and although the road isn't really haunted, it's still creepy. A fun drive to have around Halloween, for sure. Mary's grave is interesting because nobody actually knows the exact location or who she was. Some say she was killed by her boyfriend for cheating, some say she killed him for cheating, and the townsfolk killed her for killing him. Some say she hanged herself, some say she was a witch who was burned at the stake, some say her mother killed her, and some say she ended her family and then killed herself. They say if you actually find her gravestone, which is said to be behind her home, it won't appear on camera if you take a picture, and they say you can see her hanging body near said home. If you shut your car off while parked where her home is, it won't start back up. Rumors of cold spots and voices as well. I think there's something about a candle being lit in the window as well. I've never seen her home or grave. And finally, Lake Ronkonkoma. To start, they say it's bottomless. There's talk about the lake, it's the deepest and largest on the island, having hidden caverns and such. The lake water rises or falls regardless of the rain or lack of rain. The big story tied to the lake is about a Native American princess who died there in the 1600s. The princess fell in love with an Englishman, but her father wouldn't allow her to be involved with him romantically. The princess ended up killing herself in the lake, I think she rode out and stabbed herself, and each year her ghost takes the life of a man in search of her soulmate. There have been well over 100 drownings. I believe some say more men than women, but others say more women than men. There's no proof the princess ever even existed, though. I've driven by the area but never really stopped to check it out. And that's all I got. But there's tons of legends and lore out here. My grandparents own about 600 acres in East Texas, about 15 minutes down a long dirt road. So, basically, out in the middle of nowhere. The land has been used mainly for cattle ranching for the past four generations, and if you walk the land long enough, you'll find little remnants of the past in various areas, all from the 1800s, like a single, dilapidated brick well amongst tall woods, about one-third of a chimney, and an old general store, unrecognizable in the grown-up woods around it. In fact, I swear it's going to fall down any day because all that's holding it up are trees around it, and it's leaning like nobody's business. In the middle of the land, we've built a simple cabin with a long porch on the back overlooking a decent-sized pond. I'd say around 20 acres. So the first couple of stories come from my dad and his family, three sisters and his mom and dad, who lived about 15 miles from the ranch. One night, they were coming home from Wednesday night Bible class. The newspaper had little snippets of people seeing an unidentified flying object in the sky, but everyone just kind of wrote them off as crazy backcountry people with nothing better to do. So they're in the truck discussing these articles, and my dad, jokingly, points up to a light in the sky high above, saying that it must be another UFO. As they're watching it, though, 
it starts to get closer and closer, and eventually, I kid you not, it lands in the middle of the road. They come to a dead stop with this thing in front of them, these are devout Christians, and they swear up and down that it really happened. It's nighttime, so all they can see are lights spaced around a circular object that takes up the entire road. The only thing they hear from this thing is a light hum. The entire time, my aunts are screaming and begging my grandpa to turn around and go back into town, but he's stubborn and refuses. Eventually, the thing lifts off the road and hovers above the trees next to them. My grandpa takes off, going 100 miles per hour down the road towards the house, with this thing keeping up with them to their right side. Eventually, to their relief, it flies away. A few minutes later, they are pulling into their driveway and see that the UFO has landed in their back pasture, about 200 yards away. My grandpa runs into the house, grabs a shotgun, and by the time he gets back out, it flies away for good. I'm not saying that this was an alien or anything. It could have very well been the government, but they knew exactly where they lived and wanted to mess with them. A year later, my dad and his brother-in-law are raccoon hunting, so it's night time, at the ranch on the 20 acres where the pond was later placed. As they were walking, they heard something large crunching the leaves along the side of them. They'd shine the light where they heard the noise and then hear it on the opposite side. Again, they'd shine the light towards the sound, and it would immediately be on the other side of them. This happened countless times, so they eventually stood back to back and shined two flashlights at the same time in order to catch a glimpse of it. Even though they could never actually see what it was, they could hear it running in circles around them. They ended up trying as best as they could to ignore it, and all the while this thing continued to walk beside them and run around them in circles. I was about 17 for this next story. My dad and I would spend weekends down at the cabin hunting and fishing, and we would sleep in a room that had a window between the heads of the two beds looking out onto the porch. This one particular night, I woke up at about 3.30 am. To the sound of someone running and walking the length of the porch, which was about 20 yards long. Eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling, I could hear that a, it did not have shoes, b, it did not have more than two legs, and c, it was large enough to make a loud thud per step. For about 10 minutes, I've been listening to this thing sprint across the porch back and forth and then walk a few steps, followed by more sprinting. The scared, little about to poop my pants, 17-year-old girl I was just could not bring myself to turn around and look out the window to see what the heck that was. I guess part of me was terrified it would be like that scene from the Twilight Zone movie where the thing is ripping out an engine from a plane's wing and then suddenly appears at the passenger window staring at Jeff Daniels, teeth barred, with drool hanging out of its mouth. Eventually, the sound wakes up my dad, who was snoring loudly at the time. As soon as this thing on the porch senses my dad's lack of snoring, it quits. I never heard it again after that. Half a year later, my dad is out at the cabin alone. He's sighting in his new gun's laser sight, I know, obnoxious, from the porch, and something chunks a rock at him, just barely missing him. He shines a light in the direction it was thrown, and nothing. Just a field of grass, nothing visible that could have thrown that at him. He quickly went back inside. Last time I was there, a couple of friends and I were sitting in the living room and heard a series of three loud knocks, three different times, on the various areas of the cabin. Remember, this place is in the middle of nowhere, with no one around for miles. I'm pretty sure I will never stay there alone. The Devil's Tramping Ground It was the fall of 2009, and at the time, I was 16 years old. I live in the central part of North Carolina. Nowadays, the cities are loaded with things to do for the Halloween season, but back then, the best form of entertainment I could come up with was to visit the Devil's Tramping Ground with a few friends. The Devil's Tramping Ground is a local legend. It sits right outside of Siler City, North Carolina, about an hour away from where I live, and I had just gotten my license, so. Why not? For those of you unfamiliar with the locale or its legend, the Devil's Tramping Ground is a perfect, circular spot of dead soil in the middle of the woods. Despite the greenery around it, nothing grows in that circle. The legend says that if you drop or leave anything in the circle, it is moved, and or disappears, by morning, as the devil supposedly comes here to plot his evil doings against humanity late at night, pacing in a circle as he thinks. That's the gist, but feel free to do a little research if you're interested, it's a decent read. Siler City is a sticks and bricks town with long, barren roads that seemingly translate to don't stop until you get the hell out of here. It was on one such road that I began to feel uneasy. Rural areas always have that heavy twilight zone energy, and the road we were on, conveniently titled Devil's Tramping Ground Road, was completely lacking streetlights. The only things illuminating the overworked asphalt were the fading yellow headlights of my 2002 Mercury Cougar and the useless glow of a crescent moon. In those dim lights, 
we began to see splattered graffiti on the road leading up to the location. Creepy things I didn't expect but never really understood the impact of until I saw them. In white paint, the road was decorated with crude warnings, the one that I remember most was the devil lives here in a huge, white cross in front of an opening in the forest. I parked on the side of the road. The ground was not as creepy as I expected. It was not too deep into the woods. In fact, the clearing could be made out of the road. Not as menacing as I had imagined. Maybe it was the empty beer cans or red solo cups lying all around, apparently people partied there, or maybe it was the jokes my friends and I started making almost immediately that calmed my nerves, but it was two something in the morning, we decided to catch Lucifer right on his hour, and I remember feeling less on edge than I was on the road. My flashlight would get eaten through the trees if I moved it upwards, so I focused its beam on the soil, truly more interested in finding signs of the paranormal than my friends were, it was four of us total. Two of my friends went back to the car after a while. It was cold, and there was not much to see. I stayed back with a buddy of mine. I brought a Ziploc with me, along with a pocket Bible, a rosary in my pocket, just in case, and a stuffed rabbit that one of my best friends had given me. Before leaving, I scooped up some dirt and added it to the Ziploc. I found the prospect of dead soil so interesting, and I figured that maybe studying under proper light compared to other soil would give me a better idea of what happened here. Alien radiation? Climate change? Sulfur? Maybe the devil was just busy that night. In between jokes and complaining about the cold, we heard someone walking in the depths of the woods. This wasn't a mistake. This wasn't I think someone is walking in the woods. This was a definite sound and a definite feeling. This was deep behind the brush, between the trees, and these footsteps were heavy and unashamed of being heard. This was the first time I noticed no crickets were in these woods. There was no sound other than us in these steps, and I was even more unwilling to lift my little flashlight, which was tucked under my armpit and pointed towards my soil sample. My eyes didn't need adjusting, and so we stood there as I made out the shape of something in these woods. It was dark, but I could see it. It was tall, but not disgustingly tall. It was human-shaped. It stood on two feet. It would walk, walk, and stop. Then walk and walk, then stop. Towards us, I think. We were petrified. Neither my friend nor I moved. I don't even think we breathed. I was so overcome with fear that I felt numb, but a little tremble ran through my entire body. We just stared. Later, we would discuss how we both wondered if it had seen us and talk about how we didn't want to move in case it hadn't. In the future, we will also discuss the smell. It was an awful, putrid scent. Burning feces, rotting eggs, and rotten meat. I grew up Catholic, hence the Bible and Rosary, and have always been told that smell means the devil is around. That didn't help my case, then. Even typing that now, I'm slightly trembling, this thing stayed with us among the sticks of the forest. I say sticks because, at the time, very little greenery was alive. I was certain at one point that it saw me. I had that sixth sense feeling I was being stared at right back, and suddenly I had a feeling of overwhelming, unbearable despair. I realized then that my friend had been clutching the back collar of my shirt. I think I was so paralyzed by fear that I had ceased to feel anything but that numbness. I wasn't even cold anymore. But when I felt my friend's hand, I dropped everything in my arms and stood up, then hauled my ass back to the car. Not running, just very hurried. I was sure my friend was behind me, but between us, and, in all honesty, I didn't even think about it at the time. I was just ready to go. I was so ready to go, in fact, that I missed the clear path completely and took off in between trees and brush, heading towards the yellow glow of the headlights. It wasn't an incredibly long trek, like I said before, the road was right there. But it felt awful and long to me. And it was enough for those tiny branches to leave little scrapes and even some cuts on my hands, cheeks, and neck. This whole ordeal can't have lasted too long. When I got back to my car, the keys were already in the ignition, the other two friends had the heat on, and they both asked me what happened. The friend who stayed behind with me got in the passenger seat soon after, and we took off. Our other friends, the ones who had been in the car, pointed out that our eyes were swollen and bright red. I think we had been crying, or at least it looked like we had been. I looked in the rearview mirror, and my pupils were abnormally dilated. My eyelids were puffy, tender, and red. Keep in mind that this could all have some form of explanation. Maybe the fear made us cry without us knowing, and maybe the darkness combined with our nervous reactions enlarged our pupils, but it was still very odd. I realized long after that I left my Bible, my stuffed rabbit, and my Ziploc bag of dirt in the circle. I considered going back the next day in broad daylight, but I haven't been back there since. I still wonder and worry about who has my stuff. So it started in 1994, 
I was around four years old, and my family and I had gone to my grandmother's house. As we walked in the front door, I saw a short black creature standing behind the Christmas tree. I didn't freak out immediately, I was mostly curious. We all moved into the living room, and as we were sitting on the couch, the creature kept walking past the doorway and would stop to stare at me. It was slightly shorter than I was at the time, with really thin arms and legs and beady eyes. It had ears kind of like a cat that stood straight up and tufts of black hair in between them. I became increasingly terrified and broke down into hysterics, but no one else could see this thing. Eventually it walked out of sight of the doorway, and I didn't see it again. And for years afterwards, my mom would bring up the spiky Tasmanian devil, as I called it, but everyone, myself included, brushed it off as imagination. About seven years later, I was staying the night at my mom's friend's house with her adult son and two adult cousins. We were in the living room watching television when we heard this loud slam against the sliding glass door. We turned on the porch light, and standing there was my childhood nightmare. The back porch had bookshelves, a pool table, and some various boxes. This thing had thrown a book at the sliding glass door. Everyone was freaking out, and one of the others called my mom's friend to come home immediately. We noticed the door wasn't locked, and as soon as we flipped the lock, this thing went nuts. It raced around the back porch, throwing things, knocking over the shelf, and slamming against the sliding door. We all hid back in the living room, scared out of our minds. The way it was hitting the glass, I'm still surprised it didn't break. By the time mom's friend got home, it was gone. A complete mess in its wake. I hardly slept for weeks afterwards and was constantly afraid, but I felt validated that I wasn't imagining things as a toddler. The last time I had an experience with this thing was my sophomore year of high school. My childhood friend Katrina was staying the night. In the middle of the night, she started screaming, waking me up. When I finally got her calmed down enough to tell me what happened, she said she'd woken up because she thought she heard my bedroom door close. She said that when she rolled over to look at me, there was a small black creature sitting on my chest. It had a hand on my shoulders, like it was pinning me down. She said it turned its head to look at her and then ran out the door when she started screaming. When she described it to me, it was the same creature I'd kept running into. Katrina called her mom shortly after and went home. We remained friends, although more distant, and she refused to visit my home or speak much about what happened. If anyone can tell me what this is or has had any similar experiences, I'd greatly appreciate it. It's been several years now, and I haven't had any experience with it since. But it's always in the back of my mind that this thing will show up. This happened to me when I was about 11 years old. It was in the 1990s. I have lived my whole life in El Paso, Texas. The culture is rich in folklore and religious beliefs. Many Hispanic families have stories of the paranormal. One popular legend is the legend of the weeping woman, aka La Llorona. The legend of La Llorona has been a part of Hispanic culture in the Southwest since the days of the conquistadors. The tall, thin spirit is said to be blessed with natural beauty and long, flowing black hair. Wearing a white gown, she roams the rivers and creeks, wailing into the night and searching for children to drag, screaming to a watery grave. No one really knows when the legend of La Llorona began or from where it originated. Though the tales vary from source to source, the one common thread is that she is the spirit of a doomed mother who drowned her children and now spends eternity searching for them in rivers and lakes. One night, just like any other night, I lived in a trailer with my mom and dad. My youngest brother was staying with my aunt this night. I fell asleep watching Jay Leno as usual, and when I woke up, I was on the sofa in my living room. The time was 4 a.m., which illuminated the stove in the kitchen. The television was off, and normally I had a light on, but this time it was pitch black. I woke up, and I heard a horrible screaming that was coming from far in the distance. The screaming was coming from a ditch that was a few feet away from my home. I heard it, and I thought I was hearing things. I asked myself, am I dreaming? Then I started to hear the animals outside howling and whimpering. These animals that I speak of are cats and dogs. As the screaming got closer, the animals continued to cry. The screaming was something I had never experienced before. It sounded like I was in a big hallway, and a woman was screaming her guts out down that hallway. Then, in all the screaming, I started to make out words. These words being said by whoever this was at 4 a.m. Screaming their guts out shocked me. The woman said, oh, my children. In a huge panic, I quickly got up from the sofa and ran to the kitchen, which was right next to where I was asleep. I turned on the closest light and looked around. The screaming didn't stop. In fact, the screaming only got louder and closer. I questioned my sanity at that moment. Was I going crazy or hearing things? Then I thought to myself, this is real, and the animals are responding to it in a negative way. 
So I did what any other 11 year old boy would do in a moment like this. I ran to my mom's and dad's room. I reached for my mom and shook her awake wildly. She woke up slowly, and to my amazement, the screaming faded away as she woke up. I thought to myself, what the heck is going on? I told my mother, mom, do you hear that screaming and crying lady? My mom was half asleep as she said, go back to sleep, it is most likely just your imagination. I told her, no, this is real. Please listen. Don't you hear her? My mom quickly just said, you are dreaming, so go back to sleep, it's going to be okay. By then, the screaming had faded long ago, as if whoever was screaming knew that an adult was awake. I was terrified as I returned to the living room and quickly turned on the television, as I left most of the lights on as well. I didn't go back to sleep until the sun came up. I couldn't believe what I heard and witnessed. I was treated like a crazy person whenever I told my story. It got so bad that I kept my experience to myself. To this day, I don't care what people think of my experience. I know what I heard. My mom would always tell this story from when I was a little kid, I was just learning to walk and couldn't really talk much. She told me that I'd walk out in the yard, grab invisible things out of the air, and put them in my hand. I'd walk up to her and put a certain number of whatever these things were in her hand, then go back to my catch. Sometimes I'd put them in my mouth. Then I'd come back to my mom and take the same number of these things out of her hand and into mine. My parents told me that one of two things were happening. I had a crazy imagination and I already knew how to count at such an early age, or I was actually seeing whatever I was putting in my mom's hand and just grabbing what I saw out of her hand. My parents would jokingly say that I was catching and eating furries, and that's why I couldn't see them anymore. They were hiding from me because they didn't want to be eaten. It was a funny story and all until I found a photo of me when I was a baby. In the photo, I'm sitting on one of my grandparents' recliner chairs, and in one of my hands, closed into a fist, there are probably four or five small glowing white orbs. Of course, there could be some reasonable explanation for it, I could have been holding glitter in my hand and the flash reflected off the glitter, etc. But I don't doubt that in the picture I have fairies in my hand, as it matches up with the story my parents used to tell me when I was around the same age. Later, when I was a teenager, probably 15 or 16, my mom took me and my siblings to a pagan circle for Beltane. I was having a good time and just hanging out when I saw a glowing green orb. At first, I thought it was a neat green bug, I was obsessed with bugs, and that it was blurry because my vision was bad. I tried to get closer to it without taking my eyes off of it. Unfortunately, a pillar from the gazebo-like thing that we were in blocked my view, so I tried to quickly get to the other side of the pillar to keep watching it and get closer, but it was gone. I went to the place where it would have landed on the tree or the ground, but there was nothing. It wasn't until later that I realized it was glowing. It was far too bright for it to show up like that against the green trees and grass in broad daylight. I immediately told my mom, who was talking to her friend, about this, and both of them told me that it was probably a fairy. They said that before the park got more urbanized, a ton of fairies used to hang out around that time of year. They told me it was good luck that I saw one. I still believe in fairies to this day, even if they are terrified of me. I do believe in fairies. I do. I do. Five years ago, I went on a trip with my church to this place on the outskirts of Pittsburgh. I was excited to be with my friends and never expected anything to happen. Before this trip, I was not a believer in ghosts. I thought the idea was cool, but I thought it was unrealistic. Background, we stayed in this old church building that was odd looking and gave off bad vibes from the start. I'm not 100% sure what the name of the church was, but it was torn up and the bathrooms were gross. On the first night we stayed over, me and my three friends got our own room. Usually, you don't get your own room if you are under 18. We were about 15 or 16 at the time, with no leader in the room. So we stayed up late and broke the rules, as most kids would do. And on the first night, we left the window open because it was hot, and we saw something weird. There was someone looking up at us from the outside of the parking lot. Keep in mind that it was 2 AM. Or so. We looked down and began speaking to this thing, but we received no response, and it did not move. So my friends grabbed their phones and shined the flashlight, and then we discovered something. This thing had no face. I thought I was dreaming. As soon as we flashed the light, it disappeared. We were confused and began talking to people the next day. There was a legend of a ghost named Molly. We all thought it was a joke and dismissed it. We concluded it was all in our heads, and that made me feel better. So we forgot about it for a few days. My friends said they heard weird noises two days later in the morning, but they never really described them. I left before they heard it. And then something happened. We all stayed up late again that night. 
Our door was sealed and locked when it randomly swung open with force. And my friend, let's call him T, said jokingly, Molly is a witch, because he thought the story was a lie and we were getting messed with by someone. Five seconds later, the door slammed shut, and it was loud. We freaked out as it began to open again, and we ran out of the room. Context, the hallway lights were on, and we saw nobody else outside the room. We sprinted downstairs and ran into this lady. She woke up because she sensed something, and we found out this lady was an exorcist. We put a Bible underneath our door and did something else that I forgot to keep us safe, which she advised. It's a night I will never forget. And other people saw stuff, so we didn't feel alone or crazy.